Orhan Pamuk, in the, oh, oh. directly to my right, <laughs> who won the Nobel Prize last year, has lived in Istanbul for most of his life. He is widely considered Turkey's leading novelist and literary spokesman. His best-selling novels, among them My Name is Red, The Black Book, and Snow, which are almost exclusively set in Turkey, deal, among other things, with questions of culture, identity, and religion in Turkey, both historical and present. In a memoir, Istanbul, Memories in the City, and in his most recent collection of essays, Other Colors, he has produced loving and, and wistful portraits of his homeland. At the same time, he has a sometimes strained relationship with Turkey. Thanks to his honesty and outspokenness, he has come under attack, sometimes by the press, sometimes by nationalist groups. In 2005, charges were filed against him for having referred publicly to the Armenian genocide in the Ottoman Empire. Um, those charges were eventually dropped, but the uproar left him in need of, uh, sometimes in need of police protection in his own hometown. Salman Rushdie, on the far side, uh, was born in Bombay and educated in England and lived in Pakistan briefly before settling in London and then New York. His fourth novel, The Satanic Verses, which was inspired in part by the life of Muhammad, told the story of two Indian expatriates in Britain and was published in 1988. What followed is well known. The book was deemed blasphemous by Muslim communities around the world. Riots ensued, it was banned in India, and Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini issued a fatwa calling for his murder. Rushdie spent years in hiding, but continued to write, and over the next 20 years produced the acclaimed novels The Moor's Last Sigh, The Ground Beneath Her Feet, Fury, and Shalimar the Clown, as well as a number of nonfiction works. Among other honors too numerous to mention, he was made uh, earlier this year a Knight of the British Empire. <laughs> Sir Salman. <laughs> Yeah. So first, first, I, I'm just curious to know generally what associations you each make with the idea of homeland. Um, are, are Turkey and India still homelands for you, or have they become something else over the years? Do you want to start, Salman? Yeah, no, I think I think there's a there's a sense in which the place in which you grow up is is a place that you think about as home in a way that you don't think about anywhere else. You know, yeah. and and. Uh, and for me, I mean, Bombay, which, by the way, I do not call Mumbai. Um, Mumbai is a, an alien city occupying the same space as Bombay. Mm -hmm. But Bombay is home. You know, and, and not just Bombay in general, but Bombay at a certain time. You know, because I think it's, I mean, the city today is rather different yeah. than the city that I grew up in. And, and I still love it, but the feeling of home is also connected with its time as well as space. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, I always have the feeling when going to India of coming home. Yeah. Always. And part of that is linguistic too, because I, mean, I still speak um, in Hindi and Urdu. And one of the things that happens when I go back is that you know, the language is all there, but at the moment, I mean, today, it's kind of half of it is packed away in the attic. But when you get there, it, it comes out, you know. And so actually regaining the ability to inhabit your mother tongue is also part of that, part of the feeling of home. Yes, of course. I'll give a <laughs> similar answer. Of course, my homeland is Turkey, especially Istanbul. I belong there. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm out of home, uh, home here, but probably so. And I also resist whenever outside of Turkey, everyone says, oh, you're an exile, huh? Okay, now spell it out. And then I, I resist saying uh, yeah. that I'm an exile. I'm not an exile. I can return it back to Turkey uh, whenever I want. Yes, there's some protection there, too much intimidation. But then let me talk about um, why it's home is, why is home home? What the homes of the home to sort of speak. I think it's the beginnings. It's like you're a, ju a just newly born animal and your tentacles out there registering everything and you take those impressions to your hard disk and then they stay and you re evaluate and measure the rest of the life with, the, with those first impressions. I'm now be perhaps being very Freudian or whatever. Um, but then there's also the language, the culture, the things that everyone, everything has more resonance and an aura of belonging, a sort of a mother, mother, 
home is where mother is actually and my mother is still there calling me okay you have an interview with these guys beware darling <laughs> um, um, that sort of thing home is where there is this motherly voice protection where the, car, uh, the beginnings of Cartesian consciousness the, it's the beginning of the world and then I agree with Salman that it's a certain period of Turkey and for example I wrote a book Istanbul my memories and some new generation of young Turkish writers friends said well you know our town is not like black and white as you suggest it's a happier place they said but then I love the sad Istanbul I love my memories so home is your mother the beginnings your memories where, where you feel, and also uh, the language the language I, and, and one thing that I can portable about home is the language I have the language with me I can go to Mars I can go to Siberia I can go to Latin America wherever is the at the other end of the world but I have the Turkish language with me and I carry it in my pocket in my spirit and I write with it that it's my home and I can I have a portable home with me all the time and that's Turkish language I think I strongly belong to that but then I don't uh, evaluate everything uh, about home which is being home I don't also say that this is home and the rest of the world is phony and second-rate I don't say that in fact I'm aware of the homeness of the home when I'm outside of Turkey one of my books black book I wrote in the United States and it uh, there I had the most uh, radical anxiety of being Turk I had the most anxiety of my identity who am I I have faced these problems and I begin to think about my home when I was out of Turkey in 85 when I came here first to New York with my uh, wife who was taking her PhD at Columbia and I realized what home was for the first time radically when I was away from home. Yeah, it's interesting that both of you um, do continue. I mean, your, your novels are set around the world and in different places, but India and, and Turkey are places that you return to over yeah. and over again in writing, whether you're there or not there. And is that just, are you just drawn in and compelled to write about these places? I think it's just, it's just, uh you know, it's in the it's in the given of what I have as a writer. You know, and I'm not I can't. Um, I mean, I have sometimes turned away from it, but it always seems to drag me back towards it. You know, and um, it's been a kind of sometimes it feels like a tug of war. Sometimes you think, you know, we actually want to write about something else, um, and so there's a kind of moving away, but a, but a drawing back. And I think that's uh, that's just what it is. It's just going to be like that. Um, but I. I also wanted to say about what Orhan said that I, I also don't feel like an exile. There was, a, there was only one moment in my life when I did feel like an exile. I mean, there was a period of, you know, for reasons that you've mentioned, a period of almost 10 years when I was not able to go to India. Mm -hmm. And during that time, it was the only time I've actually felt the, the sense of exile. And one of the reasons why I'm unusually proud of the Moore's Last Sigh is that it's the only novel I wrote about India without being able to go to India. And when the people in India read it, they paid me the greatest compliment of all, which is they said, okay, so you sneaked back in, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> because, because otherwise, how do you know all this stuff? <laughs> was it uh, easier, in a sense, to write about it without going there? Or or no, it wasn't. Harder? It felt much harder. In the yeah. case of Midnight's Children, it felt easier. Mm -hmm. in the, I mean, I think the thing about Midnight's Children is I think, had I not been living in London, it would have been very difficult to have, if you like, the absurd kind of chutzpah of thinking that you could contain a country that size inside a book. If you go to India, you can't contain a street inside a book. You know? The idea that you could put, you know, at that stage, half a billion people or more, you know, is insane. And I think you had to be a little bit distant from it, or I felt I had to be a little bit distant from it to just to have the guts to try it. You know, but in the case of the Moors last Sinai, it felt much harder to write because of being away. I write about home because that's all I know. Uh, I write about Istanbul because that's where I spend 50 years. And when you ask me about humanity, I'll talk about humanity without forgetting, forgetting that this is I'm only talking about Istanbul. But then that's the question, in fact, that, uh, that when we're talking and referring back uh, and underlining uh, um, our home, if we do it, exaggerate and dramatize that we are away from home, that, that, that there is a home and another world, and then there is a difference, then we begin to we fall in the traps of representation. Mm -hmm. 
that, of, uh, that I write about Istanbul because that's, that, that I have come across humanity in Istanbul. And then my aim is not, in fact, to say that I, I'm going to describe Turks here, they are, that's how they are, or these are the people in, 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 in Istanbul, how they look and how they behave. Look, I, I never felt that way when I was in Istanbul, heavily embedded. I thought I was writing about humanity. When, when, once I was out of sight of Turkey and began to get translated, everyone began to say that, oh, he is writing about Turks and Istanbul. I thought I was writing about humanity. And this is uh, yeah. a, ma a major concern of I have about underlining uh, home. That is, I, we all love our homes. It's inevitable. It's almost an animal instinct to, li uh, to like the home uh, and return to it and measure everything the rest of the life towards it. Mm -hmm. But there is. These are animal instincts, so to speak. Maybe I'm mistaken. But there is also, uh, like all animal instinct, there is also civilized side to us, the, but more calculated, more intelligent side that controls things. And that side of me is telling me uh, this as well, that, that now that I'm outside of home and they're asking me questions about homeness of the home or whatever home is, what it means to me, I don't want to underline and uh, this distinction between home and other places. Once you begin to do that, then you are out there to represent home. And yeah, then I, I got into lots of trouble. Remember when I got into lots of trouble, that seems... An unusual thing to say. <laughs> um, yeah, but actually, what kind of trouble, no, no, Thomas? No, no, before that trouble. Before that. <laughs> but I, when Midnight's Children was extremely kindly reviewed in the New York Times book review, um, the critic used this phrase, uh, the sentence which was extracted by every publisher, which said, Midnight's Children sounds like a continent finding its voice. The rest <laughs> of the continent... Was angry. Was really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you know, what are we, chopped liver? You know, they, <laughs> what He's the only one who's speaking. What about 200 years of literature in, you know, 17 yeah. different languages? Yeah. You found the voice? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's not only uh, this uh, problem of representing, then uh, Salman obviously refuses, and I also refuse, but then... Inevitably, once there is so much pressure that, oh, your home is there, and when you write about love, uh, then you're writing about home love back there, these people you represent, then there's so much pressure that either you try to ignore it, or you, do so, you spend so much energy and will to, you, trying to ignore it, that then you're also distorted mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. I think home is home, and then home should be addressed in a natural way. I think, in the end, Home is the world. Yeah. Uh, that's where I feel I belong to. Uh, I, I home is where humanity is. Mm -hmm. And then at ma my back, in my motherly home, I, I manage to see all humanity. There is no home if you disregard humanity that you have to uh, uh, address and see in your, in your home all humanity. And that's the wonderful thing about literature, that you talk about your small street. All, I, I know very little life, I little in life, you know my neighborhood, my family, friends, all of my friends who know me in Turkey say, well, everything you write is autobiographical, Orhan. Yeah, yeah. don't tell anyone, I say. <laughs> uh, 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 that, but I shape it around, and that, in fact, the great gift of literature is such that you just switch it around this way, try and error, turn it around, then it's not your autobiography, it's humanity's story. <laughs> yeah, my uh, mother, who knew everybody's dirty secrets, <laughs> um, I mean, my mother was this kind of, kind of Garcia Marquez of gossip. You know? <laughs> she had this fantastic, this labyrinthine structure in her mind about exactly who had done what to whom for several generations. You know, and, and it was a great resource. You know, and there was a point at which she said, "I'm going to stop telling you this stuff because you just put it in your books, so I get in trouble." <laughs> Um, this comes back to the idea of the mother as, as home. But the one sense in which it has become kind of problematic, certainly to, I think, to writers from the third world more than to Western writers, is this question because it gets connected to this idea of authenticity. Yeah. You know, that American writers, European writers, have always felt free to go live anywhere in the world they wanted to live. You know, if Scott Fitzgerald lives on the Riviera, you know, if Joyce lives in Trieste, if Hemingway lives in Paris, um, they don't somehow stop being 
um, you know, American or Irish. Um, if an Indian writer lives in London or New York, it's a problem. Um, and not only that, there's also an expectation that if you're an Indian writer, you should only write about Indian material. Okay. Again, the, you know, Western writers have always given themselves the freedom to write about anywhere they like. I mean, sometimes with um, questionable results. Yeah. You know, one need only think of John Updike's novel about Africa, you know, to, 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 for that question to be posed. Um, the coup one of the worst novels ever written. Um, <laughs> um, um, but, you know, if, if Picasso wants to use African art as a model, fine. You know, if, if an Indian writer wishes to use an, a Western source as inspiration, suspect. Right. You know, and, and so there is this double standard that, that, um, that one has to deal with. You know, and actually, of course, in the case of India, anyway, this is a huge diaspora culture now. You know, there are Indians everywhere. And the Indian experience is becoming a diaspora experience as well as a national experience. You know, and there's no reason at all, it seems to me, why a writer living in Silicon Valley should not write an interesting novel about a village in India. You know, um, but it's the response to it in India is very complex now. Yeah. Well, one thing that you both have at your, at your disposal is not just the, the Bombay of the 50s, 60s, or Istanbul in your lifetime, but, but the, the historical eras of, of both countries, which you've both written about. Um, you've set novels well before your time, yeah. and also made use of the folklore of these countries, um, which seems to be a great resource. Well, it's um, kind of, yeah, I mean, it's wonderful coming from an old culture. Yeah. You know, it really, it really is. A, it's what do you think of that? <laughs> I mean, sorry, America. <laughs> um, hey, I come from England. You know, you know, you know, I mean, I, there's always something delightful to me when somebody points to a mid-19th century building and tells me how old it is. <laughs> um, um, yeah, well, sorry. Yeah, well, uh, well, well, of course, valuable thing about what, what is dear about home is not its history. Of course, once you belong there, you care about the history, but it, history is such an artificial thing that the politics change and history changes. Mm -hmm. You pay attention to, you find, you try to uh, um, find your own history. Home is also about authenticity, that when you're there and when you, you, have, you hear these first voices, first sights, first sounds, first smells, the rest feels a bit fake, phony. Okay. Then again, a, a, another part of your f uh, mind should fight against it because if you insist on, on too much about wholeness of the uh, originality and authenticity of the earlier smells, earlier recognitions, earlier motherly, tenderly feel, feelings, then uh, judging the rest of your home experience as my secondary, phony, not authentic enough, then again, you are, although you're paying attention to belonging, uh, okay. paying your respects to your mummy or your family or whatever is the beginnings and being loyal and that is uh, what is accepted and it's a taboo not to do so. But on the other hand, you disregard the humanity of the rest of humanity. Home okay. is bo uh, both a challenge to uh, accept and embrace. It's what feeds us. But then uh, we have to be aware of the fact that once we exaggerate it, uh, once we base everything on homes of the home, then there is a, there is a, uh, a risk of the, um, being a little bit disrespectful for the rest of human experience. Mm -hmm. Also, look at this another way. We all leave home. Yeah. You know, we all do. We all grow up in our parents' home. And at some point, we make a home of our own. You know, so, the, so the idea of home is not singular, it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's narrative, you know, I mean, you, 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 you have a home that is given to you and then you have home, a home or homes that you make. And people who never leave home are kind of sad. No, I disagree. <laughs> I disagree. No, no, look. Okay, finally we disagree. Uh, I, I, let, I'll let me make my case. Um, I, I wrote this, my book, Istanbul, uh, when I, I never considered, I ne rarely I have left uh, um, Istanbul, I wrote about it. I, there were times that I left Turkey, stayed here, when, for example, three years in New York when my, my, I was here with my wife. 
but there are people who are uh, judging home, uh, I would say, by the, by the criteria which is not embedded in uh, home's culture. What counts is not staying at the same place. You may stay at the same place, but that you would be uncomfortable at home. I think it was Theodor Adorno who made this remark about morality is not feeling at home, wherever you are home. And, and in order to not feel at home, you have to have another criteria, another idea that is not homely. Then you can stay, I mean, residentially, your address may be the same. I hope, I, I wish my address were, were the same all the time, and still is. Uh, that, but on the other hand, you have a different, not homely mind. That's what counts. What, then, if you have a different point of view, read different books, you have different criteria, you don't agree with the community, then I think you are deeply in, at home. That it is very superficial to be at home and agree with everything. I think it's, you have a deeper sense of home if you have a set of values, you, which as I did as an autodidact from books I have read all in my solitary uh, reading hours, I derived um, values, literary uh, images, in fact, utopian visions that I should, I should entertain my mind with, then I judge my home, in fact, wrote about home with ideas that are not homely, and then I manage, I naively think, pin down home better than guys who had stayed there and taught the things that were required to think so. Mm. See, I think, just to, this is saying something similar, but, or related anyway. I mean, I think there's, um, the, it's a thing I've written about in the past, so if anybody's actually read something I've written, forgive me if you've read it before. Uh, but it seems to me that in human beings, in all human beings, there are opposite impulses. There is the impulse to home and the impulse to away. You know, there's the, the desire, the dream of roots and the dream of leaving. Uh, and, and I think we all have that. We all have that, that uh, feeling of comfort and solidity and uh, an explicable existence, you know, meaning that comes out of being in a place to which you feel you belong. You know, and, and, but there's also a kind of exhilaration in the self and a discovery of the self, the discovery of the other, which we also all seek and respond to in the act of leaving. You know, and, and I think what's happened, however, is that the dream of home, of roots, has been culturally privileged. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and we think of that as good, you know, that, that to, to belong and stay and, and, and inhabit the thing that is the thing you accidentally were born into. Um, and that the dream of leaving, you know, the, 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 the exit, the deliberate chosen exit, is more problematic you know, and, and, and uh, sometimes suspect. Mm -hmm. and, but the thing is, interestingly to me, is that if you look at our artistic production, you know, whether, it's, whether this is books or movies or whatever, it's those figures who we are excited by. You know, the, the ones who go on the road, you know, the, the, the tramp, like Chaplin, you know, the outlaw, the bandit, the criminal, the person who goes on the wrong side of the tracks, you know, the lever, you know, is actually what we dream about. So it's, it's as if we spend our non-imagining selves trying to construct ideas of home and place and belonging. And our imagining selves want to be these outlaws. You know, and, and it's that tension, I think, both those things are in us, are in all of us. Going back to something Orhan was saying, um, in terms of your formation as writers, what was more important, where you came from or the international community of writing that you were discovering? I, I think it's both. That I, I, I think, in fact, interesting thing about being a writer is that you get this universal general ideas from the books, you read them, you, know, you believe in them, they are very valuable, you want that back in home. They are attractive because home lacks them. Then, then what makes international you know, ideas, whatever the idiom of international interesting things, so to speak, is that you don't have them at home. Uh, ideas are interesting because you don't have them, and home is interesting because they, they don't have these ideas. In fact, <laughs> that where the creativity, writing of books, uh, the electricity that you feel, that you feel obliged to represent, write about, 
create, improve, explore, is that there is an, always a problem with home and always a problem with these general ideas. General ideas, when you impose them at home, then they do not work well. When, and they say, well, you're getting all these European ideas from books, but this is Turkey. And then, it, it's the, it's the, and, and sometimes the other way around, you have all this, your Turkish stuff with me, with you. I was always, I said this so many times, upset about when, well, I write a book, and then it's reviewed in some place, and they say, and I write a little, say, a love story, and they say, oh, Pamuk is writing about Turkish love. It's, and then you refer back to, uh, back to your home. Um, so it is a constant struggle between uh, uh, the parochial home or the smallness of the home, mother, uh, uh, motherly, tender feelings at home, the beginnings, and the general thing. Of course, humanity wants both. I mean, um, that we want the general... Uh, 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 um, control and command the universals and also belong to particulars. One thing about being in West or being at the, living at the center of the world is that that's a privilege, say, once upon a time Balzac or French literature enjoyed, maybe perhaps now English literature or English-speaking literature is enjoying that you are both at home and you also have ma you're mastering the universals, which is, if you look from my corner of the world, I get upset and angry about that. I want to fight <laughs> against that. That, that, uh, that the, some, to some privileged authors, home is where they can speak out for, in, in the name of humanity, in, in, in almost platonic universals, and also have the smell, smell of colors of, dirt of the little uh, street. Is, uh, this only happens in countries that rule the world, so to speak, control the cultural world, so to speak, but, but also, also uh, that makes it problematical, I think. I mean, when, I, when I was starting out as a writer, I resisted the idea that because I came from India, I had to write about India. You know? and, um, and my first novel was, or my first published novel, um, there's this unfortunate heap of shit <laughs> that, was, that was never, yeah, it that was was, similar that was, that was never yeah. published. But yes, but I wrote this novel which actually takes certain themes from um, from Sufi philosophy, but tried to set them in a kind of, deliberately to set them in a kind of Western science fiction or fantasy context. Right. And that was a deliberate attempt, if you like, to denature them, yeah. you know, and, and to, to say that these, these kind of ideas are not simply culturally specific, you know, that you can discuss them in the context of any setting. And the result was an incredibly bad novel, <laughs> um, which now embarrasses me profoundly. It's the thing my publishers keep telling me not to say. Um, uh, but the experience of doing that made me very, very profound. You're breathing, Morhan. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it made me very profoundly rethink uh, what I should, how I should approach the business of being a writer. And, and it actually did take me back to beginnings. You know, and, and I thought I'm going to go to somewhere much closer to myself, somewhere much closer to a, a world that I know. And, and what I thought, I mean, long before I knew what, what Midnight Children was going to be about as a book, um, I thought I would write something that came out of childhood. That I would write a novel about or of childhood. You know? And um, it didn't occur to me in, in my first conception that it would become this much larger fiction with kind of public dimensions. You know, I really hadn't thought that. I just thought I have to go closer to home um, in order to find out who I am as a, as a writer, you know, if anyone. Um, and so for me, that was the key that unlocked the door. You know, and I mean, since then, you know, once you go through the door, you can, you know, you can go all sorts of places. But for me, if I hadn't found that, that place close to home, I wouldn't have found a beginning. You resent sometimes being told that you're writing about Turkish love, not love in general, or Indian situations, not such. Do you, can, can you ever take a writer away from his country? Would you have a Borges without Argentina? Would you have a Proust without France, or a Faulkner without America? Well, of course not, but then you're, you're hinting at the answer, you know. Yeah, but that's a certain, <laughs> that's, that's a certain kind of writer. That, uh, yeah. you know, uh, that's yeah. a certain kind of writer. I mean, as I say, you, you can have a Hemingway 
-hmm. without America. But that implies that Americans have this imperial vision that they feel at home every place. <laughs> they don't need a visa. <laughs> and they, uh, and then, then they have the money and they go and every, every no one asks them, why are you here? And they accept it's natural for the Americans to be all around. While if I go, so why are you here? Is this your first time in New York? I've been asked this question for the last 25 years so many times. Uh, yeah. No, I get asked this. I get, you know, if, I, if, I, if I venture some observation on the likelihood of Rudy Giuliani being the Republican candidate, um, a broadly speaking, negative observation, um, people say, oh, so you think you understand American politics? And I think, yes. <laughs> um, but it is, it, is a, it is this strange difference which has to do with the history of the world. It has to do with imperialism and colonialism and so on. That, that the, the assumption is that Western writers can be writers of the world whereas Eastern writers must be trapped in their region. Someone, it's not unfortunately an assumption, it's a fact. Uh, no, yeah. uh, but then we have to fight against That's this fact and you can, show that it's an assumption. Yes, you replace yeah. a fact by yeah. a new fact. Yeah. You know? But I was very well aware of the fact that uh, when I wrote Fury, I, I was very well aware of the fact that I was going to get into, how shall I put this, even more trouble. Mm. You know, because, of, because of a kind of turf war. You know? yeah. Oh, what, he's going to come and tell us about us now? Look, you know, they're asking about us uh, home. They're asking this yeah. question to us because yeah. then they feel that we are out of home. Maybe yeah. let's uh, ask them I've got a home. about their home. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a home. It's uh, in actually Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> and I have lived there for some considerable time. Um, Do you and think, I think you're an American writer? Hmm? Do you think you're an American writer? No, not in the, I'm not an American writer in the way that that Roth is, or DeLillo is, or Cormac McCarthy is, mm -hmm. you know, but, but one of the great things about, let's say, New York City, is that anybody who brings their story here automatically makes it a New York story, yeah. you know, and so it's one of the pleasures of living here, that there are, that the stories of the world become the stories of this city, you know, and, and um, and for me, I wanted to write that kind of book. I would, I would not presume to write a novel about a kid growing up in Newark, you know, in, in, the, in the 40s or 50s, you know. <laughs> um, um, but I can write about the kind of New Yorker who is somebody who has arrived, you know, and, and who is making his story one of the layers of the stories of the city, you know, and I think that's a, that's a subject which is mine. Now that we have come to New York, uh, and now that we are here, and another part of being uh, uh, a strong subject about home is that you have to, when you're home, you have to be nice to people at home, right? Uh, so now that we are here, we have to be nice to people at New York. And of no, course, actually, you see, I disagree. I think the home is the place where you don't have to be nice to people. <laughs> no, okay. Look, and they have to put up with you anyway. Okay, my, uh, okay then my definition of home, which I discovered just lately, is this, that, that, that I, I had an event at the uh, public library, and then someone said, you know, it just came, and I think that's the most instinctive re uh, reply that I ha ever had about home and outside of being home, and they said, so what's the difference of, between here and Istanbul? And my immediate answer was that, Oh, in Turkey, in Istanbul, I feel responsible about everything. Why I f here, I don't feel responsible. Uh, maybe uh, if I stay here too often, stay here, uh, then this Dostoevsky and fear that the dictum that he said that we have to feel responsible to everyone about everything, maybe slowly and slowly down upon me. Here I feel I'm not home at home because I don't, feel that I, I left that responsibility behind and I am, I'm only here with my freedom of playfulness, being away from home's responsibility, um, the weight of belonging and responsibility and sh you feel in obliged mm -hmm. to answer all questions. Mm -hmm. And also at home, a writer is in my part of the world, not necessarily Turkey, 
that, uh, that, that, that if you're a writer, you're a professor of everything, you're responsible, you have to have an information about everything and answer and address all the questions the nation, the country have. have. While here there is a, a bit of a uh, more freedom that you're a writer, you write your books, you do your interviews, you promote your books, and then the beauty of the book that counts is that's it. Yeah, and, I and, I, and perhaps because of that, or perhaps I haven't lived here enough to, get, to pick up enemies, angers, resentments. Uh, of course, there is some part of me that I'm sure that I will begin talking here more radically in the, on the coming years. But then, what makes it, for me, the distinction between, and it's different for every person, I imagine, is that, that at, uh, at back in Turkey, I feel responsible for everything, not that I show it all the time, uh, but here I feel freer and then things are happening. I'm a voyeur and it's a nice feeling and I'm, I'm, I'm a visual writer, don't forget that. No, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very moved by Orhan's sense of responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've always felt... I'm also, I feel responsible for you too, Salman, don't like, worry. <laughs> no, well, I don't feel responsible for you. <laughs> I've always felt completely irresponsible. <laughs> I, I, as, you know, I think, and you're, you're kind of saying that by getting here and being able to shed that sense of responsibility, it's a kind of a liberation. Yes. You I know, and, so. and I mean, I've always been in favor of a responsibility, mm -hmm. really. But this question about also about writers being expected to know everything, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it is very bizarre. It's very bizarre. I mean, I find myself, you know, I, I, as, you know, we go around the place and I'm endlessly asked to solve the Middle East problem. Yeah, but then it's, you know, it's, it, they endlessly. never ask you to solve the American problem, no, by no, the way. No, 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 but uh, tell us what, I say, and I always say I'm glad you asked me that question because as it happens, I'm the person with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of mystifying that the governments of the world have never realized this and approached me because otherwise it would be solved. <laughs> Um, and this sense that writers kind of in some way have the answer is, you know, it's a myth that I think we should encourage on the whole. But, uh, <laughs> we are doing that. A, yes, it's dangerous, dangerous to, to, un, to deconstruct it too much in front of this darkened space out there, <laughs> drinking people. Yeah. <laughs> um, on, a, on a different tack, you both come from, uh, you're both relatively secular people who come from countries in which religion is... is Central. So, sorry? Secular. Is yours, yeah, okay. In which religion is central. Does that make you feel less at home in your own countries? No, because there's always a bunch of people who agree with you. you know? <laughs> um, there's, yeah, there's yeah. also a strong secular yeah. history of there, there's secular, a secular tradition in both yeah. countries, yeah. I think. And then yeah. it's, it's not, religion is not so um, um, strong, uh, it, yeah, it doesn't crush everything. That then the, do you feel it puts you on one side of... of a wall that's put in the middle of, you know, splitting no, the country? No, I think you feel that you're involved in a kind of argument. Uh, but actually, what, that's, that's, if you like, that's a non-fictional answer, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, the fictional answer is that it doesn't matter mm -hmm. whether you believe in something or not. Mm -hmm. If you're writing about people who do believe in something, you have to faithfully create that reality. You know, I mean, that's, it's, you would be a very bad writer if you could not create a worldview other than your own. Yeah. You know, um, um, uh, in, in, my, in the mind of somebody you wanted to write about. So, actually, when I'm writing fiction, it's complete. My, my own, if you like, religious beliefs or lack of them are kind of irrelevant. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to make the people live. And if those are religious people, then they must be religious people. And if not, not. I mean, it's, it's a... you, but you've also studied uh, Islam, and, st and you, you're mm -hmm. very knowledgeable. About, you're responsible for it. Um, and it's, it's played a central part in several of your books. And Orhan, your, your last novel, Snow, was about um, a secular person going into a very religious community and almost from a journalistic point of view. Mm -hmm. So, so what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> obviously, these themes are important, even though they're not actually, you know, the well, center of yeah, your life. Yeah, um, writing novels is about um, our capacity to identify with people who are not like us. Uh, all my friends are tel uh, telling me that I'm write always writing autobiographical fictions, but then uh, some characters are autobiographical. Then I do my best to identify with people with whom I don't politically, culturally agree with. 
that, for example, in snow that you refer to, is there's a character called Blue, which is a sort of a uh, radical Islamic fundamentalist. Then I did my best to identify it and show it, as Tolstoy say, as a good man. And that is the, I think, duty, I wouldn't say a duty, the joy and challenge of writing a novel mm -hmm. that you don't, you don't have, a, although theoretically in a, in a corner of your mind you have a set of values which judge this person. When you're, you're writing fiction, you have to do your, your best to forget about, the, about these values. They may be home values, there may be values that you have imported. Uh, um, or uh, you want to forget about, but the essential thing is that, uh, that it's best to be able to identify with people who disagree with you religiously, secularly, this or that way. Um, I think when we're referring to home, what matters most is that it's, it's a subject matter. It's where you started, but then we can do everything. I can, I can write a novel that takes place in New York, in Mars, in Latin America, in places that I've never been to, the problem is to find the right tone, the right voice, and if it's artificial, that if you haven't lived these experiences, the tone of the novel should be also artificial so that it works. Mm -hmm. That I think I believe in the art of the novel, that, that you can do anything with it. We are not buried with our homes. The home stays with us. It's the beginnings, but it's not necessarily what we write all the time, yeah. that we carry it. it also, there is uh, also expectations, commercial expectations. Now that, we are, we are, now that you are asking us about home, now that it's obvious that we are not originally from here, everything wants, everyone expects that you do something, and if you do otherwise, they think it's not authentic enough, it's not real enough. You may not be knowing about this stuff. So they also want to pigeonhole to you to a home. We all love our homes, but then we, are, we have all the capacity to go beyond it, come back, play around it. Home is a center, but then we are also creative people and cook can turn around home and make home more interesting, go back and forth. That's the interesting, yeah. about, the interesting thing, I think, about home, that you can carry it all the way and return and reach it with new experience, so forth and so on. This is an easy thing to say to a New York audience because actually almost nobody's from here. <laughs> I mean, that's it. Not so many people come to a great city like this from elsewhere. Yeah. That the, the subject of of you know where you come from, you know, is is a, a big subject for any you know for millions of people in this city. But I, mean, I think the very interesting point that Orhan made, the question of, of tone and form, that I mean, it's very well illustrated, for example, by Kafka's novel about America. Yeah, he's, a, know, he's never mean, been uh, to America. Yeah. Kafka never came to America, you know, and and uh, his novel, which was posthumously given the title America. Um, by Max Brod, in which he himself, I think, wanted to call the Stoker. Um, that America with a K yeah. um, is a wonderful novel, which kind of isn't about America at all, yeah. except that it takes place, in a, a lot of it, in a place called America. And that ability to create a fictional space, you know, with a real name, if you like, you know, it's a, that's a, it only works if you get technical aspects, right? It's to do with tone, form, rhythm, language. It's not to do with, quotes, reality, unquotes. No. And the novel is not really a realistic form. And, and this is something which much contemporary literary criticism loses sight of. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I mean, the novel is an imaginative form. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a formalized dream. You know, I mean, these things did not happen. These people did not live. Um, these, these events were not so, you know. Um, and to insist on the fictive nature of fiction, you know, is, is also to liberate you from the question of authenticity and location and roots. You know, you can, we can make this stuff up. Also, there is, maybe we have, uh, after talking about Kafka, then there is the writer who sees home every place. That, I think that's when you hmm. refer to a pe pe person who uh, never leaves home and as a, sad, a, a sad person. I think the sad person is the person who goes out, out in the world, but see, is happy to see home every place. <laughs> uh, that there are authors like that. In fact, that is our, our minds are constituted so that we feel secure, comfortable when we realize that although we are out of home, we see, oh, he is like my mummy, he is like my brother, he is like my boss, he is like my teacher. Oh, the world is such a comfortable place. 
Oh, yeah. Orhan's mother is looming <laughs> over the hill. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> She's <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Um, but you know, I had this, I wrote a, a piece some years ago about the Wizard of Oz, and one, one of the things I said there was that the only bit of the movie I don't believe is when Dorothy says that there's no place like home. <laughs> you know what, Kansas? <laughs> there are many places <laughs> like Kansas. <Andrew. laughs> I mean, it's in black and white. Yeah. You know, Oz is in Technicolor. Yeah. Um, in Kansas, there's nothing to eat. In Oz, there's, you know, nothing to eat. Um, <laughs> actually, nobody eats in The Wizard of Oz. Um, but the idea that she would prefer impoverished, barren, you know, Miss Gulch containing Kansas to the world of squashed witches, you know, it's absurd. I mean, it's, there obviously are many places that are much better than home. You know? yeah. um, and, um, and in fact, it's a thing which Frank Baum perfectly understood, because if you read the sequels to The Wizard of Oz, not only does Dorothy return to Oz, but she makes her home in Oz, and not only that, but she brings Aunt Em and Uncle Henry with her. They all settle in Oz and have the intelligence to leave Kansas behind. <laughs> so, so, so sometimes the place you go to is better than home, you know, and um, it just felt like a lie, yeah. you know, when, when, when at the end of the film, when the kind of lesson she's supposed to learn is that she, didn't, that, that she never needed to leave home in the first place. You know, rubbish. <laughs> of course she needed to leave home. There were no cowardly lions in Kansas. You know, or not that she met anyway. Yeah. Going back to your point about, um, you know, it's all fiction and it's invented regardless of where it's set. A, a problem you've both had is people taking you literally. Yeah. Um, is reading your fiction as fact and and that taking it they personally. They have to do read like that. It is, what I write is all facts. But you run up against this problem with people thinking, A, you're writing as yourself, not as a narrator, and B, what you're writing about is actually happening, and there's, you, you have a certain audience that doesn't suspend yeah. their, their belief. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the point about being a writer. You write fiction, and they, uh, people judge you about your write, uh, as if you're writing journalism, and you have to answer all the questions in that manner. Uh, that is the interesting thing about mm -hmm. fiction. But the reader both knows it's fiction and also judges it on reality. And given that the question you're most often asked as a writer is, Did you how, leave is, that film is, is how autobiographical is it? You know, that's the most. I developed a technique on book tour, which is to give opposite answers to consecutive journalists. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, that, you, that you would say, you know, it's not, aut it's not autobiographical at all. You know, I mean, I just, it's just all kind of out of my head. And, um, why would you Im imagine that it's autobiographical? And the next journalist, you say, it's totally autobiographical. <laughs> Everything that happened in this book happened to either to myself or to, to close friends or family members. And these interviews appear on the same day in the same city, and nobody ever notices that you've contradicted yourself. <laughs> Which just shows that nobody reads interviews with writers. <laughs> Do you, have to, do you have, ever have to think of yourself because of this as reporters, in a sense? Do you feel you, feel you have to be faithful to the reality of the yeah, situation? Look, if, sometimes. Yeah. So sometimes. if you underline the wholeness, the, uh, the authenticity of your experience, that, that this is something that no one had lived, and that this is the, the strength of my fiction and my imagination comes from the authenticity of the uh, experience, which if we over underline the fact that there is a home and then that's the authentic thing, then yes, the question of uh, authenticity or journalistic value, the realism, the realistic content of what you have written is, out, it begins to go up, 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 up. I think that, that we have to accept there is a home, it's dear to us, it's like my, my mother, uh, and, but then <laughs> it's the beginning, so, but then it's not, it's not the, whole, it's the only criteria to judge the rest of the experience. I, we, uh, we all feel obliged uh, to pay attention to it, return to it, turn around to it. But then, again, uh, that experience, there is no sense, I don't believe in the uh, uh, understanding that the, the only real experience, authentic self, is there. The rest is not true. 
I always, uh, James Joyce wrote Ulysses in Trieste, not in Dublin, um, that we carry our homes with us, but that's the beginning. Then we invent things over it and continue that we have to underline the fact that there is a home, that's where we started, maybe in order to understand what we write, what we do, we, we need that, but that is, uh, um, our, our work is not, should not be based on their realistic content, whether it's uh, faithful to the home, it is a both combinational imagination, human freedom, and something that has left from home, of course, which is for me is more language and memories. And I think, I, you know, on this subject of reportage, I, think, I mean, I think I have two things to say. One is that there's an aspect of the truth, you know, what really happened, which is very energizing to a text. You know, and it's true that Joyce wrote Ulysses in Trieste, but he took with him the Irish Times of June the 16th, you know, the Irish Times of Bloomsday. He carried with him everywhere he wrote that book, and almost everything in that newspaper finds its way into the novel including the name of the horse throwaway that he's going to bet on, including the advertisements, you know, what is life without plum, plum trees, potted meat, incomplete, you know, with it an abode of bliss. Um, so he, in that sense, he took the, the trivia of the everyday life of the, the day he met his wife um, and made it the basis of this great novel. You know, so there's, there's one sense in which, yes, it, that you know, I mean, I remember, for instance, and used it in, on Marine Drive in Bombay, there's a pedestrian bridge that goes over the road that goes by the sea, and there's always billboards on both sides. You know, and I always remember there was a time when, on one side, there was a, 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 an advertisement for Esso, which said, put a tiger in your tank, you know? And when you go to the other side, it was a, a safety warning, which said, drive like hell and you will get there. You know? And I thought the fact that you had these two different approaches to motoring on, op on opposite sides of the same bridge, you know, was very attractive. You know, so of course, if you're going to steal, you steal the good stuff. You know, so, I, so in the same way as, as Joyce would use the trivia of that day, you know, that I, I would also try and pinch the trivia of everyday life. You know, and put them in. But the other issue is is a if you like, a more kind of historical political issue, which is that there, is, there was a, a role for the 19th century novel um, of bringing the news. You know, like when, when Dickens wrote about poor schools in the north of England, um, it did a great deal to hasten the reform um, of those schools, I mean, after Nicholas Nickleby. Um, we don't so much see the novel as having that role now because there are much bigger um, information, information media faster available, but I think the problem is that we live in an age where the truth is so trivialized, falsified, and simply hidden from us, you know, that, that the novel still has the role of bringing the truth. But they also you know. trivialize and falsify our novels, what about that? <laughs> well, that's just <laughs> nasty of them. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, there are, there are moments where, which anyone knows when your memory of a historical event is very much at odds with the way in which that event is officially described. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it becomes the case that your personal memory is, is by, that, by that fact politicized. You know? um, I mean, I remember, for example, uh, to give only one example, the 1971 Bangladesh war, the, the war for the liberation of Bangladesh. Um, in which the Pakistan army committed a number of well-documented atrocities. Um, uh, you know, executions of college professors, burnings of trade union buildings, et cetera, with people inside, et cetera. I mean, there are eyewitness reports, there's photographic evidence, et cetera, et cetera. However, no Pakistan government from that day to this has ever accepted that those things happened. And, and when people refer to them, they are called lies. You know, so, so what happens is that if you simply are performing an act of remembering, mm -hmm. this becomes at odds with official history and therefore um, you know, becomes, becomes um, an act of, of, of uh, reportage. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is occasionally still uh, in the novel 
a place for that. You know, it, it's a very problematic place because the problem of writing about contemporary events in a novel is that the subject changes, you know, and we live in a world in which the subject changes very, very fast. And what can then happen is that the thing you've written ceases to be interesting because nobody is thinking about that anymore. You know, so that, that's, a, that's a very particular minefield for anybody who wants to incorporate contemporary material in a work of fiction. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about now essays or, or political pieces. But, so the question is, how do you incorporate that material in such a way that it's properly integrated into the fictional architecture of an imaginative work? You know, and that's a very difficult question, but that's the only way you can do it unless you want your work to be only topical. I know, you know, whenever we publish a piece of fiction in The New Yorker, we get at least one letter from a reader saying, you know, what a nice story, but unfortunately, you know, you have your facts wrong and Gruyere yeah. cheese doesn't smell or that bridge is in Delhi, not Calcutta. Well, one of the great experiences of being published in The New Yorker is to have fiction fact-checked. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh, it's true. <laughs> are you doing that, Deborah? No, I'm not, personally, we haven't fact-checked. There are people for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember that the, once, many years ago, writing a short story which was published in the New Yorker, and in it there was a reference to a man living in Bradford in Yorkshire in England with the last name of Dar, D-A-R. And he was not even a character in the story. He was off stage, referred to. The New Yorker fact checkers got the Bradford phone book and looked through it, and his, his first, his initial was M. His first name was Mustafa. So they looked through the Bradford phone book to see how many people there were with that name. They came up with five people. They phoned them in order, <laughs> in order to establish that they were not the people in the story. There was one person they failed to reach. And so on the press day of the magazine, I was asked if I could replace this name with another name that was not a problem, but because it was about to go to press, could the name be the same length? <laughs> uh, I rebelled. <laughs> uh, but it is, there's something very beautiful about having fiction checked for factual inaccuracies. <laughs> thank you both very much. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.